Alert from Calendar, Scout Meeting Class A. Welcome everyone to this Professional Development Hour presentation brought to you proudly by the Atlanta Metro Chapter of the Georgia Society of Professional Engineers, an affiliate of the National Society of Professional Engineers. This presentation is brought to you tonight live from Wild Wings Cafe in Dunwoody, Georgia. Before we begin, we'd like to let you know that any opinions presented tonight are solely the opinions of the presenter and not that of the Georgia Society of Professional Engineers, the National Society of Professional Engineers, or any other of its affiliates. We certainly hope you will enjoy tonight's presentation. So sit back and relax and on with the show. You want to switch? Start over there. <coughs> All right, everybody. Good evening. evening. Welcome, Welcome to, to our monthly, monthly intermeeting. meeting. My, My name, name is Jesus Sandoval. Sandoval. I'm, I'm chapter, chapter president of the Georgia Society of Professional, Professional Engineers. Uh, our, our presentation today is, is going to be on uh, Hurricane Ian and, and the engineering lessons learned, learned since the Katrina uh, hurricane. Before we get started, we want to make a couple of announcements. One, One of them is uh, volunteers. If, if you, you haven't, haven't already joined and you have to become involved in the Georgia Society of Professional Beer at the local, state, and national uh, level, I highly encourage you. This is an organization that advocates for the interests of uh, engineers. So I highly recommend that you do. We have many, many opportunities for you to get involved. Uh, before, we also wanted to let you know we are on LinkedIn, we're on Meetup, and as a matter of fact, I want to ask you a question, how many folks heard about the tonight's meeting through LinkedIn? How about Meetup? Word of mouth? That's usually the best. Okay, great. Okay, we've got a great presentation for you today. Uh, the presenter is Dr. Herman Fritz, and he's going to talk to you about the uh, lessons learned since the uh, Hurricane Katrina. Katrina. Please, Please join me. Give <laughs> Dr. Fritz a warm uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good, good evening, everybody. Um, so, Hurricane Ian makes this presentation very timely. Uh, but the engineering lessons learned are, of course, from previous events. So, but we will, of course, uh, tune in to tune in to Hurricane Ian a little bit. Um, so <clears throat> Hurricane Ian, in many ways, is, is also a deja vu to other events, uh, barrier islands and uh, bridges and roads to barrier islands often get interrupted. Uh, barrier islands can get cut into two pieces, uh, like here going out towards, uh, towards Sanibel Island. Um, most barrier islands are basically sandy islands, so <laughs> there is really uh, not a whole lot there to prevent any ephemeral inlets to form. Um, and change the landscape completely. Now obviously once, uh, once access is interrupted, it makes it very complicated also for, uh, uh, for first responders and, and for, for, for any, uh, 
logistics uh, to go in after an event. Structures um, can get damaged uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, and in some cases, like here, there's only the piles left, like here in Fort Myers at the pier. Um, so typically, wind damage is going to be top down. So that would mean the roof goes first. Um, now in this case here, there's more of a storm surge and storm wave damage. So you're going to get um, the waves hitting from below and then causing these uh, decks to pop one after the other. And essentially, you're left with an array of piles. Uh, coastal erosion, um, well lighthouses always make for good pictures, um, but also they also highlight kind of the position of the shoreline, um, which is also uh, one of the big challenges here. Uh, coastal erosion is a major threat uh, during hurricanes, but also with sea level rise and so forth. Um, so, which poses significant questions, you know, do we defend here with engineering measures? Do we uh, nourish the beach by pumping sand from offshore to the beach and so forth? But there are a lot of questions to be asked uh, going, going forward. Um, <clears throat> coastal communities washed away, that's kind of what we see after every hurricane. Uh, a couple of years back, Hurricane Michael came pretty close to Georgia. Um, in, um, in Mexico Beach, in, uh, in the Florida's Panhandle, for example. Uh, you could have, could have very similar pictures. You could take one picture and swap it out and you might not know where it is unless you know the town in detail. Uh, there are also some success stories here, though. There are some houses which are still standing, uh, for example, if we look over here and over here. Uh, so some of, the, uh, some of the things that the engineering reconnaissance teams can go look at is, you know, what houses were built under which building code, which houses survived, which houses got destroyed. Of course, there's a lot to do with the position along the shoreline, but um, when it comes to roofs staying on houses, uh, there has been significant improvements uh, made since Hurricane Andrew. So, there, so the, the building, uh, the codes, the code changes and so forth um, to accommodate for, for the wind forces, there's significant improvements there on that side of things. Um, on the water side, that's a little bit of a different story. And with that, I want to jump a little bit, um, sort of doing a back to the future kind of thing here. Okay, so, so 1965, Hurricane Betsy. Um, that's the one before Hurricane Katrina that flooded New Orleans. Uh, so New Orleans had 300 years in, uh, in 2018, founded by French in 1718. Uh, and the big questions for a place like New Orleans, of course, is, is it going to see the next 300 years? Okay, so it's all 300 years since 1718. 302, 304 years now, but uh, the question is, will it see the next 300 years? And um, levees were breached. Um, President Johnson flew over it. Um, so did President uh, George W. Bush in uh, 2005. So after that, um, well, Congress, in terms of New Orleans, instituted a a 200-year um, hurricane protection plan, the idea being that you know, events with a term period of about 200 years would be uh, protected uh, by, uh, by the levees that would be built um, after 1965. Um, then came another famous storm in 1969, it's Hurricane Camille, which is still the record storm in terms of uh, wind speed measured from an airplane, actually. So there was an airplane flying, an Air Force plane flying into the thing. Uh, this is before satellite, satellite uh, um, measurements in terms of the wind speed, which is what's usually done now. Um, but with uh, 315 kilometers per hour, um, almost 200 miles per hour wind speeds, um, measured by a plane flying into it, it's still the record holder for U.S. landfalls, at least in terms of wind speeds. In the Pacific, there have been higher wind speeds, uh, if we go to the Philippines and so forth. Uh, Highway 90 along the Mississippi Gulf Coast uh, looked pretty bad in 1969, okay? Um, massive coastal erosion uh, washes uh, Highway 90 along the Gulf Coast away. Uh, strands vessels, these are images that we also see after tsunamis, for example, okay? So you need a huge amount of storm surge to have enough draft to bring these vessels ashore. Uh, the difference to tsunamis, perhaps, is that they usually, with hurricanes, they usually pile up pretty close to the shoreline when it comes to, uh, when it comes to vessels like this. Um, the Army Corps uh, did a survey after Hurricane Camille and record storm surge heights. So this is basically guys going out, 
Seeing here's a high water mark here, mud line, okay, and I'm measuring this, referencing this to the shoreline, a damage stream line up here, and so forth, and uh, that's going to give us some data in terms of an envelope of how high the storm was at a, at a given location. Uh, FEMA also does this because they need this for flood insurance. Um, the big debate is always if you have flood insurance or if you don't have flood insurance, uh, did the house get blown away before it got washed away or did it get washed away and so forth. So there are tasks to figure that out. Uh, so then Hurricane Katrina, that's basically 40 years after Hurricane Betsy. Okay, so the plan for Congress was in 1965, 200-year hurricane protection plan. Well, it only took 40 years to, um, to take care of that plan that uh, civil engineers uh, came up with. Um, <clears throat> crosses the uh, Florida Peninsula and then heads due north, category five uh, storm in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. And then the other thing that's different here is while Hurricane Camille still has the wind speed record in 1969, uh, Hurricane Katrina is huge, okay? So the diameter of the storm is very critical when it comes to, when it comes to the coastal impacts that you're gonna have. The bigger the storm diameter, the bigger is that fetch of wind blowing over water, pushing water ashore, generating storm waves, so usually the size of the storm can be more critical because we have other storms like Hurricane uh, Ike in 2008 that hits uh, Galveston, Texas, or Hurricane Sandy um, 10 years ago that basically hit Manhattan, but at landfall it was barely a hurricane. Um, but because it was a very big system, it causes a lot of damage. Uh, and on a uh, side note, uh, Saffir Simpson uh, hurricane scale, or hurricane wind scale, as it's called now. Um, Saffir was actually a graduate of civil engineering at Georgia Tech. Okay, so it came up with that scale. Um, however, it only goes by wind speed. Okay, and wind speed can be deceiving and is also dangerous because some people think that oh, we're, going to, we're going to survive the storm because, well, I survived Hurricane Camille 1969. It was a category five. My house is still standing, so I'm good, okay? when they announced that Hurricane Katrina was only a Category 3 at landfall. There were literally people who saw it like that. And then it turns out that their historic Mississippi home, home got washed away by Hurricane Katrina. So it is more complicated than just going by category. Um, obviously, there was Category 5 in the middle of the Gulf, uh, which is uh, sort of here. And there was a Category 3 at landfall um, coming in. Looking at the wind fields. Um, typically, the wind field is going to be big on the right-hand side because we're rotating counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. If you go to Australia or Solomon Islands or something like that, it's the other way around. But here we're counterclockwise, so on the right side, we're going to have um, the northerly winds here, and they're going to be bigger than on the left side just because the storm system is also moving <coughs> forward while it's rotating. So you have uh, um, two speeds that add up, so relatively speaking, you have more speed on the right side. Now the big news was after Hurricane Katrina that when you turned on the TV, I was actually at the time returning from the Indian Ocean because I was surveying um, in East Africa. Um, I was coming back from Madagascar and, 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 and Oman. Um, <clears throat> the Indian Ocean tsunami in August of, uh, some late surveys of the Indian Ocean tsunami in August of 2005. And I had been in Indonesia and so forth. And, uh, and, um, and then I woke up on a Saturday morning in, 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 in Georgia, and then basically we have a mega disaster right here in the United States. Not some far-flung place in Sumatra, but uh, uh, right here. Um, now models have been run before. Um, this is actually Hurricane George here from 1998. But um, so NOAA runs these forecasts, runs these models, and um, usually a storm that comes ashore on the Louisiana-Mississippi border will cause havoc uh, for Mississippi, okay? Um, that's why when you woke up on Saturday morning, it was actually turned on the Weather Channel or any news channel, really. The first news was New Orleans dodged a bullet. That was the first news, <laughs> New Orleans dodged a bullet. Well, it turned out New Orleans didn't dodge the bullet because what then happens is the storm surge, because the system was very large, pushed into, pushed into, um, Lake Pontchartrain and um, also came from the other side and into Lake Borneo flooding uh, New Orleans. Data, um, unfortunately, was not much available because all, all, the, all the NOAA tide gauges uh, were washed away in Mississippi. So there was not a single tide gauge that was still operational in, in Mississippi and in eastern Louisiana as well. 
This is actually Dolphin Island, um, which is already in Alabama. Uh, most of you have probably been there. Beautiful place. But this is almost 100 miles from where the storm came ashore. It was actually very far away. So we only had, that's the first time we have an actual record of, of Hurricane Katrina. So that then basically meant that, um, that we needed field crews to go back out um, and do surveying. Um, but before I talk about field crews, which included myself going out there with uh, undergrad students at the time. Uh, at the time I had just started in, in Savannah at a satellite program for Georgia Tech, uh, which doesn't exist anymore, but that's a side story. Um, one of the particularities about this Mississippi River Delta is that it's fundamentally flawed, okay? It's a creation of mankind of the Army Corps, okay? It's a bird foot delta. A bird foot delta is not a natural delta, okay? Any bird, any, anything called a bird foot delta is already basically flawed, okay? It's like a skeleton. Basically, there's nothing on it, okay? So a delta should be a, a nicely filled delta, but it's not. Um, compared to other deltas like the Irrawaddy River in Burma or Myanmar, for example, large delta, much bigger than the Mississippi River Delta, and intact. Here, all we have got left is a couple of fingers. And particularly after Hurricane Katrina here, you really only have levees left, and that's it. Um, so surveying on these levees, as a grad student here from South Africa, and a geotechnical grad students were looking here at, uh, looking here at levees, uh, trying to see why they failed and where they failed. Now on the Mississippi River, we got lucky with Katrina because the Mississippi River levees didn't fail. Okay, because one of the problems on the Mississippi River levees fail is that, that now you can't turn the Mississippi off. Okay, so when you have to plug the levee afterwards, it's a big challenge for, for engineers. Um, but there are some bizarre things when you're driving, when you're driving to the mouth of the Mississippi River. Um, so if you're driving down to Venice, is that um, the road is lower than the levee, obviously but the river is higher than the road. So when you are driving, you are actually looking up at vessels, okay? So imagine that. The river is higher than the road and the nearby land, okay? So the, the, so the river is basically a kind of like a high line that's being maintained just by levees, okay? You, don't re you remove those levees, those 100 miles of levees between Venice and New Orleans, and the river will go somewhere else, okay? The river will go somewhere else into the Gulf of Mexico. But because of navigation, the port, and the invested infrastructure in New Orleans, over 300 years, essentially, the river is maintained in that pass. Um, some of these other levees, um, because out here in Burras, Louisiana, um, the challenge is that the only land that exists is basically surrounded by levees. On one side, the Mississippi River levees, and on the other side, levees towards the Gulf of Mexico, and you're basically like a soup bowl uh, for each town. Uh, these levees get overtopped, and then from a geotechnical perspective, you can see here where the grass student is standing there, Andrew. Basically, once the water overflows, it starts scouring on the back side, and eventually um, those sheet metal uh, pilings and those concrete eyeballs will rip out eventually. Okay? So this is a stretch that hasn't failed, and this is a stretch that failed in the same area. Once it fails, well, it's game over, but uh, you go ahead. Yeah, question about that. Has anybody done a study to determine, because of the levees, how much soil is not getting scoured that would have landed in the delta in New Orleans and in turn use that to help keep the land level up in the levee? Yeah, so, so that is of course the, the, the big problem with, with, with the levees that we have now is that all the sediments basically get transported all the way to the mouth of the Mississippi River and then to the abyss of the Gulf of Mexico and, and don't contribute to growing the Mississippi River Delta naturally anymore. So that, that, is, that is a point, but I don't have any numbers in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, volume calculations there. But the Army Corps is trying to make cuts now in these levees, have outlets in different places, and try to partially rebuild certain parts of, uh, of a delta. Um, um, but it's a, it's a difficult undertaking just because it used to basically be just naturally flooding. What yeah. was up, up in the tree? Yeah, so this one, I want to, uh, let me quickly go, uh, previous here, there we go, one more previous. Uh, that's up in the trees as a refrigerator, okay? That's just to show, uh, and the refrigerator is not windborne, it's pretty heavy. The refrigerator just floats like a boat, okay? So it gets carried up into a tree and it's deposited there, and that's uh, about 15 feet up. That gives you some idea in terms of 15 feet of water in, the, in that area to support uh, floating, uh, floating, uh, 
floating refrigerators. Um, <clears throat> So we collect data, put it together. One reason we had to do that is because there were no instruments. Okay, all the instruments basically died in Mississippi and eastern Louisiana, so there was no way to even know how high the water was. Even the envelope we didn't actually have. So it came down to going out and measuring high water marks. Um, one of the other things we did is we went out with the National Park Service, the Mississippi Barrier Islands, and looked at how they fared. Um, and barrier islands, they get torn up during hurricanes. They reduce a lot of land, a lot of lengths. They get cut into pieces. And um, that's um, what we see here. Uh, Cat Island, that's the westernmost island in Mississippi. Um, it's a T-shaped island, pretty unique. Um, there's a pretty interesting side story here. It was a Bodie family that privately owns the island. And before Hurricane Katrina, a couple of years prior to Hurricane Katrina, they sold the federal government and the National Park Service the marshes down here in this part of the island because their house is up there. So it was a pretty good land deal because after Hurricane Katrina, that land was pretty much gone. Okay, so, um, so that was a smart move. But um, completely underwater, uh, 15, 20 feet of water over the entire island. Um, so completely engulfed. Okay, so basically basimetry during, during, uh, during a storm. East and West Ship, perhaps the most famous islands in, uh, in the Mississippi uh, Sound. Um, <clears throat> part of the National Park Service, there's Fort Massachusetts on West, uh, on West Mississippi Island. You can take a ferry that will take you, will take you right here. Um, Hurricane Camille cut East and West Ship into two. So there used to be one island and Hurricane Camille cut into two right here. Um, East Ship to the right has been pretty much completely eroded. Uh, lost several miles of land uh, during, uh, during Hurricane Katrina and there were more than uh, 25 feet of water over some parts of that island. Okay, so essentially the water was pretty deep during, during Hurricane Katrina. And the Army Corps now has been going through a billion dollar project to try to rebuild these islands. Um, because studies have shown that if we rebuild these barrier islands, we get more protection for the port of Gulfport, which sits to the north, for example, and so forth. Um, so how did these pine trees look? So this is actually a Navy ROTC student from Santa Ana State there. He was the first lieutenant afterwards when he graduated uh, from Georgia Tech. Um, and um, the 25-foot rod here, and the rod doesn't reach the top of the bark stripped uh, stripped off that pine tree. So basically what happens is you get floating debris and the debris grinds with the waves on that tree and eventually you get a peel on that tree, on that snack, and eventually, and you have that for one tree, two, three, three trees, and they all give you about the same reading. This gives you some idea in terms of how high the water is when there's no other way to figure it out. Um, now if you go back to Sanibel Island after Hurricane Ian, then we had seen this basically before with Dolphin Island in, Mississippi, in Alabama. Uh, the island cut uh, into two pieces right here and uh, part of the island road essentially being no longer accessible. Uh, massive erosion. Um, erosion on the south shore, on the uh, ocean facing side, uh, resulting in hydrants being at buddy height so you can hug the hydrant. Um, this oil rig here actually, it says Houston, Texas on it. Um, but it was actually uh, off the coast of Louisiana, off the mouth of the Mississippi River. Drifted 100 miles to, um, to Dolphin Island and was of course completely wrecked here. It's, it's a jack up uh, rig, it's completely bent legs and uh, completely collapsed here in the superstructure. And the, uh, and it's the old company, while we were out here on Dolphin Island, the old company was trying to, had a crew here, trying to work, of trying to, to get this thing uh, pulled offshore. Um, it was probably a pretty big loss here. Um, so this was measuring, this was measuring sort of the height uh, of the erosion here on hydrants, trying to see how much uh, land we're losing on this beach. And on the back side, uh, towards, uh, towards the Mississippi coast, on the north side of the, of the barrier island, or the Alabama coast here, you have boat docks that would be engulfed in sand. So essentially the entire island shifted north uh, by a couple of hundred feet, which basically means that some of the houses that have beachfront, they were gone and in the water. And some of the houses that didn't have beachfront, now they have beachfront. So, um, and I also worked with some geologists here at the time. We were uh, digging up sediments. Um, 
uh, to collect samples and so forth. The idea with this is you get you know, a foot of deposit from this storm, and if you dig deeper, you might find other records and so forth, and then you can try to see you know, what's the return period of these kind of events, try to go beyond history, uh, or try to characterize some of these historic events where we don't have too much data on. Um, this is difficult here because it's too much sand, too much sand on top of sand. This wasn't as fruitful like as in Thailand or Indonesia, uh, where for tsunamis we literally got kind of that tiramisu cake where we got, you know, a chocolate layer of organic, the beach sand, another chocolate layer of organic, and then we were able to figure out, uh, or scientists were able to figure out that the return period might be 500 years for an event like that. So sometimes these things can be uh, very helpful. In this case, it wasn't, didn't lead to a whole lot of uh, new insights. Uh, the Borivage Casino, uh, the beautiful coast in French. Um, well, the Mississippi had the law, the casinos had to be in water. Um, so they had to, had to be on a, bo on a, sh on a boat uh, uh, on the Mississippi River, or then um, built on water, um, which essentially resulted in massive bottom-up damage. This is the highest building in Mississippi, 346 feet at the time. And uh, there's not a single window broken. Uh, we have peak wind speeds here, so in terms of actually windproofing a building, this, we did pretty good. But then the bottom up is not looking so good, okay? So the bottom part here, that's where the casino is, uh, got completely torn out. Uh, so we get, you know, 30 foot high water marks on these things here, and also through here, this is where the roulette tables would be and so forth, okay? Um, that was not a total loss because the uh, casinos have deep pockets and they're quick. So they rebuild right away. So one year later, they're back in business. Okay? One year later, back in business. The rest of the Mississippi Gulf Coast did not look like that at that time. Most people couldn't get insurance, couldn't go back, couldn't rebuild. So you would have the, you would have the casino and then you would have a Waffle House and then there would be a mile of nothing and then there would be the next thing. Okay, so the, for, for, for local residents to come back was a whole lot slower, but uh, the casino rebuilt um, pretty quickly here uh, with, uh, with, uh, with this year. They didn't find the boats though, did they? Yeah, they didn't find that, yeah. Now some of these barges here, like this is not a casino, this was, uh, I forgot the name of this one, but I think it was South Islands or something like that. But this was a barge, okay, it was not a way to create a casino, it was put it on the barge, so I satisfied the law to be on the water. It's not that great of an idea because now this barge becomes a projectile, okay? And this got carried over a four-lane highway, Highway 90, and lands on top of an apartment complex that acts like a baffle block here, a uh, bumper, okay, and stops it. So the laws have since been changed in Mississippi. Now you can be within half a mile of the coast, something like that, to avoid these kind of uh, construction um, loopholes where you then basically build a casino by just putting it on a barge in front of a hotel on the beach and then you're officially in water. Um, the Highway 90 and then the uh, railroad line behind it kind of formed, uh, kind of formed, uh, uh, formed a barrier of inundation in Mississippi. So that was the good thing about Mississippi was that there's a little bit of topography there in Gulfport and so forth here um, so that it didn't go that far inland, okay, in terms of inland flooding. Um, although we had the highest uh, storm surge here, you know, close to 30 feet, I mean, very high, high water marks. Gulfport has been massively expanding since, uh, the port has been growing. Um, at the time here, the, uh, the state port uh, had significant damage. Uh, you see bottom up damage in all these warehouses, but the roof is still there. Okay, but uh, the storm surge, the storm waves tore through there, causing a lot of damage, um, and you can kind of see through here afterwards. You can uh, uh, see right through where the waves cleared everything out, along with the storm surge. <clears throat> uh, Bay St. Louis, um, Mississippi, uh, across from uh, Pass Christian and Long Beach, Mississippi. Um, there was literally only an island left. Then the rest of it was completely engulfed uh, all the way over to I-10. So this area was hit. It was hit very hard. Uh, significant erosion on the beachfront. Um, and also massive deposition of sand in, in people's houses. So then there's three feet of sand in somebody's backyard. Um, rebuilding here two years later, that's the same road, was rebuilt. That saloon is still there. Um, the bridges had to be raised significantly because all the bridges got destroyed. So you see a remnant of an old structure here, and you see a new bridge here. So they have been built to much higher, much higher levels because the problem was that all the Highway 90 bridges looked like this after Hurricane Katrina, which is a major problem because now you cannot bring in 
first responders, uh, reconstruction, logistics, everything gets very complicated because even when you were serving, when I'm in Ocean Springs, I can't go to Biloxi. Now I gotta backtrack, go inland, go around, come around to just get to uh, Biloxi. And then the same thing once I'm over in Pass Christian, I gotta backtrack to Gulfport, go up to I-10, come around and get to Bay St. Louis. So all the bridges look like this. Um, built too low, essentially what happens is the waves, when the storm surge rises and the storm waves are hitting that bridge deck and there's also air trapped under those beams and then these uh, bridge decks pop one after the other and collapse. Okay, so it looks like a war zone here. Nature cleaned up much better here actually. Every element is almost like a domino stone. Uh, um, very organized pattern of failure here. When they, uh, when they design a building Yeah, so basically all the bridge, pa all the bridge, uh, all the bridge uh, elements became blowout panels if you want because one after the other basically failed, right? So um, the, the, uh, there were other solutions proposed uh, from earthquake engineers and so forth to use, you know, giant chains to attach it to the piling, uh, to the support structure to avoid having those decks uh, pop free. Uh, but the forces involved once you get waves hitting from below are huge and so this will not be possible without significant damage to the structure. So what was done afterwards was, uh, was uh, Mississippi Department of Transportation went big, collect federal money and go high, right? So they're, they're ringy dingy little bridges here, okay? These kind of things started to look like this afterwards, okay? so. Um, and that way you don't have these drawbridges anymore to open up for sailboats and that kind of stuff. And, um, and you're out of the water, okay? So uh, at least the bridge is still gonna be there after the next storm, uh, which I think is very important because it will facilitate access. Now in Mississippi had about 200 deaths for Hurricane Katrina. That's probably gonna be out comparable what we're gonna have for Hurricane Ian in Florida, okay? But what made Hurricane Katrina a mega disaster is New Orleans, okay? And only certain wards of New Orleans account for the majority of the casualties. So what you have is flooding from a couple of sides. You have flooding coming from uh, Lake Pontchartrain because it's pushing in here and then pushing down. So that's one of the things. And then we have that alligator mouse on the east side here from the Lake from Mississippi Sound here, but it's water being pushed in into navigation canals. So we have the Inner Harbor Navigation Canal. Um, and then you have some levees along those canals and then one of those eventually, uh, several of those eventually failed. Um, in particular, the Lower Ninth War, which is actually then over here, is where then the bulk of the fatalities are. So if we look, 80% of the city underwater, okay? So failures in different places uh, cause huge parts of New Orleans to, to be underwater. Now the French Quarter, where you, most of you will go when you visit, uh, was picked wisely to be in the highest spot. Um, but also uh, after, after Katrina, there was only like a foot or two of water in the French Quarter, so Bourbon Street was actually open pretty quick, at least the bars. There was nowhere to get food, but you could get a drink. No, so, <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> now the lakefront, the lakefront, Lake Pontchartrain is another very shallow, uh, shallow water body, okay? So shallow water bodies have the problem that once wind blows over it, um, the water can't escape, so you're gonna build up a huge amount of storm surge. And um, now here we have the wind, blowing from the north to the south, okay? So this is looking north, basically. And some of these levees, um, there was some erosion on them and so forth, but a uh, large part of them were intact, okay? So it was not high. These levees are not very tall, they're less than 15 feet, but, but most of them uh, did, did quite well. Well, that's, that's a month later driving through one of the neighborhoods, but um, there were some failures on some, of these, uh, on some of these canals that are being used to pump water out. Um, so 7C3 Canal is one of them, and we were able to show here that when we looked on the, on the uh, lakefront that it didn't actually overtop, okay? So this is a geotechnical failure, okay? When you have a failure before the design capacity is actually reached, okay? That's another problem. So once you get overtop, you know, as an engineer, you can kind of say, oh, well, you know, I never designed for this, okay? So uh, we were just out of luck, but here is actually a little bit different. Uh, the 17th Street levee here, uh, this breach right here actually happened as a geotechnical failure. So there was actually no overtopping here. It actually fails before it reaches capacity. Okay? That's not a challenge in New Orleans 
and in coastal areas, also in Florida, of course, uh, is that uh, the foundations and the soils that you have to work with are usually very weak. Okay, in New Orleans, we call this the gumbo soil. Okay, you put some weight on it, it will start to think. So, so it's not so easy as to build, uh, you know, massive concrete structures like in Japan when you go into rocky foundations. So one breach here, a couple of hundred feet here, uh, about 350 feet, something like that, and then one whole neighborhood underwater. Um, so that was in the Lakeview area. But then, let's go to Lower Ninth Ward. Okay, that's where we have more than 1,000 fatalities, essentially, in one, in one ward of New Orleans. So we have the Inner Harbor Navigation Canal, which is supposed to be a shortcut for ships not having to go all the way through the Mississippi, but being able to get to the harbor through the Inner Harbor Navigation Canal. So this is not for the largest vessels, mm -hmm. for smaller ships. And um, you have the Navigation Canal on the right. You have these levees here, uh, were 15 foot levees at the time. And then uh, you have the Lower Ninth Ward on the left, which is 20 foot below sea level. Now large parts of these um, got over top. And in some parts then, they weren't able to keep up and they breached. So we got a couple of breaches. That's myself there on the sheet piling, just for scale. Uh, this is one of the largest breaches here. Uh, it's almost a thousand foot long breach. And then essentially the entire neighborhood behind uh, is basically washed away like a dam break wave. Because now I have a 15 foot levee that fails and I'm 20 foot below sea level. So now I have 30 something feet of water that essentially are rushing in, okay? So in this area here is where we had uh, probably more than half the fatalities for Hurricane Katrina. Um, then things were rebuilt, so the Army Corps was quick to try to patch these things. So you can see here, this is, a, this is a, a, an initial patch here, uh, just to uh, have some protection, um, to be able to be able to pump things out, uh, because you're below sea level, so you have to pump out and you have to be able to keep the water back and also in case another storm were to come, uh, which it actually did with Hurricane Rita at the time. The other thing you can see here is that giant barge. Okay, so you have to imagine here, the, the Army Corps of Engineers of the United States um, trying to fight this hole that's forming. Okay, so they were trying to drop bags of rocks from Chinook helicopters and so forth. But once you're dealing with a thousand foot hole, this is a very big problem. And there's really no, nothing you can do at that point. They even tried to float this barge, and so that's the last ditch attempt. Tried to get a barge, had to get the barge to plug the hole in the levee, okay? But the barge went right through the hole, okay? So, uh, and then even landed on top of a school bus here, just for, for reference here. Um, so that gives, you, that gives you some idea of some of the struggles. Um, so once you have failure, you're kind of, uh, there's very little you can do afterwards. Now what you see here, what looks like a wall of water, now, Hurricane Katrina was before the Twitter, Facebook, internet kind of stuff, but um, so this would basically be called now, you know, on, on social media, oh, a wall of water and this and that. But what's going on here is just overflow over a levee, okay? So this is basically just overtopping and then water running the back down the back side. It will start to scour, it will start to erode, and if the levee doesn't keep up, then you get a failure. Um, there's another picture here which gives you some idea of what things looked like in terms of how high the water level was behind in the, in the open ocean side and uh, how, it looked, uh, how it looked in front. Actually, when I was an undergrad student uh, a long time ago, I did some experiments here uh, in Switzerland, actually, but uh, we were looking at erosion uh, of embankment dams here and we are looking at flow patterns and so forth. And uh, once you, if you get the backside to, to fill up before you breach, uh, then your levee might survive, okay? But usually, usually uh, problems begin with this top thing here. You have a lot of high velocity flow here, a hydraulic jump on the backside that's going to scour out. So usually you don't make it down to this stage here, um, and you usually fail before that. Now if you look at uh, some of these levees here, there's a good picture here um, from the Clairvaux Bridge here, um, looking um, towards the east essentially. Uh, and uh, you see Lower Ninth Ward to the right, and you can see some of the levees that hadn't failed yet. We can see the scouring uh, behind that levee. Uh, we see that barge, and then we see that uh, we see that thousand-foot hole, uh, thousand-foot hole up here. 
So some of the solutions then because of that scouring behind the eyewall was to kind of have like a collar or an apron here that essentially uh, sticks out on these, on these eye walls. So when water goes over the top, it doesn't just scour out on the back side right away. Okay, so that was an immediate uh, implementation from that. Um, and then these things are anchored and there's also sort of a uh, concrete slab on top there uh, to try to avoid um, the scouring behind that eye wall and a, a rapid failure. Because the thing with hurricanes is you don't have to survive forever. You only have to survive for a couple of hours, maximum a whole day maybe, okay? Um, where the storm surge is going to be really high. But if you survive that, uh, then even if you have some overflow, um, then your levee will actually survive. And if you can limit the amount of water that goes over the top, even if you have some water going over the top, as long as you don't have any failures, um, you're going to get some flooding in the backside, but um, your, your victims might be limited because you have, uh, it's going to be slow rising, uh, slow rising water. Okay, then came uh, Hurricane Gustav in 2008. And uh, the Army Corps had a new plan now. So after Hurricane Betsy, they had the 200 year hurricane protection plan. After Hurricane Katrina, the wording changed. Okay, it's called politics. Now it's a 100 year hurricane risk reduction system. Okay, the pervert protection is gone. It's now called risk reduction system. I'm no longer guaranteeing I'm going to protect you. And it was 200 years before, 40 years later, it's 100 years, it's built higher. Okay? And that's one of the things we're going to see a lot going forward because of climate change and things like that. Um, what we call a 100 year flood might be something else, okay, and so forth. So you'll see a lot of that uh, wordsmithing in different places. So in 2008, that's basically three years after, okay, 1,000 days after, more or less, um, all the levees have been rebuilt, okay? So to at least the same standard like before, and most of them have been uh, raised a little bit. Um, at least all the holes were plugged, okay? They have been, but some of the things hadn't been built yet. One of the things that hadn't been built yet is a storm surge barrier. Okay, that's what's being talked about for Houston. Uh, very expensive project, um, the Ike Dyke, okay? Um, to basically cover the entire, close, being able to close the entire Houston navigation channel off. Uh, it's been this, plans are being discussed for New York with the Hudson River. Uh, so basically it's one giant barrier that's going to cut off here this alligator mouse that we have there from the Mississippi Sound and Lake Borneo going into the navigation channel here. Um, so there's two things to say to that. One is humans always fight the last disaster, okay, because Hurricane Katrina caused a lot of problems there. A lot of money was spent right there because we want to make sure this doesn't happen again. The Lower Ninth Ward shouldn't be flooded again. So this barrier hasn't been built yet, okay, in 2008. So, um, by the time I made landfall, it was only category one, I think, hurricane good stuff. But these levees don't look so good, okay? They're already at the top. Okay, the bass top is basically full. As water waves splashing over it. Okay, and these are the rebuilt levees, not the old levees, okay? Um, so there's not a whole lot of left here, okay? In terms of uh, if we have a category five and the direct hit, well, it's not gonna look so good. Okay, so this is that stretch that I showed you before uh, that had been uh, rebuilt. Um, so there's two things. One of the things that was mentioned here is sort of having a breakaway panel. So one, th one section is actually the old levee here, um, which is lower than the rebuilt one uh, over here. Uh, and it's a designated overflow spot. So the idea now is that, okay, before it starts to overtop here, I'm going to let water gradually flow over here and basically having and starting to flow the neighborhood slowly. So rather than having all the houses just getting washed away by a giant dam break wave, the kind of things you do in war zones when you blow up a dam and then wash away what's downstream, rather than having that happen, I'm going to allow things to sort of fill up gradually, okay? Uh, which is going to mean that, you know, people might have a chance in the roofs and so on to survive, okay? That's not a good position, proposition, but uh, it's better than nothing. So basically there's a more than 35 feet between the water level here and these houses back there. Uh, there were almost new houses in 2008 back there because Lower Ninth Ward is one of the poorest neighborhoods uh, in New Orleans. And the only houses you see here actually were, were, were uh, sort of celebrity project. Brad Pitt had a, a, um, a charity who built four houses and that kind of thing. The problem with that is 
Well, it's nice to build four houses. The problem also is that from an infrastructure perspective, you have to bring in sewer, you have to bring in water supply for the city, you have to bring in power, you have to bring in gas lines and all that. That's not very attractive when you have very few houses. That's one of the other reasons why it's difficult to come back if you don't have a city uh, behind it. Uh, and then, of course, vessels get, get moved around, um, like toy vessels. And here it hits uh, one of those bridges here. Um, so that was essentially New Orleans. Um, New Orleans after Gusto, that's three years later. Um, now the most important step happened afterwards is when this is that, what they call the um, Greater New Orleans Hurricane and Storm Damage Risk Reduction System, HSDRRS, okay, 100 year level of protection. It's now higher than what was a 200 year level of protection in 1965, and that's important because for engineers it's one of our biggest challenges going forward, in particular as the civil infrastructure is. What we're designing for now may not be what we should be designing for in 20 years, or in 50 years, or in 100 years. Okay, and that's going to cause huge problems for infrastructure around the, around the world. Okay? Um, so this is barrier here um, that was completed um, a couple of years ago. Um, it's a 1.8 mile barrier that essentially closes off this alligator mouth here, okay, which basically trumpet funnel that funnels all the water into the navigation canal. To some degree, this is also fighting the last disaster because this is what uh, caused most of the harm during Hurricane Katrina, caused most of the fatalities, was this water that's been pushed in here, goes around and hits one of the weakest spots and kills a lot of people. So humans have the tendency go for, to go to Indonesia, you go to Sri Lanka, wherever you go, there's always a tendency to fight the last disaster. This is an example of that. Now, it doesn't mean it's a bad idea, it's a good idea, okay? But it is also very targeted. There are other scenarios in other places where they are not, uh, we haven't seen this kind of investment. Because there were million dollar simulation studies done after, uh, after Hurricane Katrina and they can't see what kind of scenarios would be possible. The height that they came up with here was 26 feet, okay? I have a survey point on Lake Borneo, not too far from here, down here, where I had 23 feet, okay? So without the million dollar modeling studies, I could have come up with 26 foot high levees, okay? So that's an also what goes on in, uh, in modeling studies, okay? Sort of making sure that, you know, Hurricane Katrina is included plus a freeboard. Um, but yeah, a lot of scenarios have been run, okay? But things have to be looked at with a grain of salt. Um, the marshes deteriorating rapidly. And when you look out towards the east here, over the Mississippi Sound, then what used to be a carpet of marsh is no longer really a carpet of marsh. It's more sort of a drowning carpet of marsh uh, with massive erosion and this giant barrier across. Um, and then these are the soldier piles going in in 2009 here uh, to try to build this barrier, uh, close it off. And this is then what the whole system looks like when it's complete. It's complete now. And for navigation, uh, for navigation, uh, there have to be some passages so that these uh, uh, inner harbor navigation canals and so forth can be accessed by vessels. So one of these gates is here with these sector gates. Um, that's one of those passages here. Um, yeah. So that's uh, that's on the New Orleans east side. The idea with that barrier is that now I'm having one main perimeter that I'm defending on the outside. I no longer have all these arms of canals because when I have 400 miles of levees, somewhere I'm going to find a weak spot, okay, that I'm not going to have maintained or somewhere the specs are not met and so forth. Because you need all these arms that go in, A for navigation, but the other reason you need it for is you have to pump water out, okay, because in New Orleans when it rains, you have to collect the rainwater, pump it out. You have to collect the sewer, pump it out. Um, and there's a lot of places around this world we have to pump too. It's not just New Orleans. You don't have to actually be below sea level to pump. Even stormwater in Savannah, Georgia, which sits on a, on a bluff, by the way, um, you know, the historic part is probably 40 feet above sea level. But um, to get the stormwater fast enough, out fast enough to avoid flooding in the streets, you still have to pump the water into the Savannah River. Okay, so even in Savannah, Georgia, we are pumping water out. When, uh, when we have uh, a flash flood uh, type of situation. But some of the other things that were built, um, some of the other things that were built uh, on, on, the, on the lakefront, there are other examples of, uh, of navigation structures. And then one of the largest, uh, on the south side of New Orleans, you can see the Superdome in the background there and the, uh, and the uh, skyline of New Orleans, the Mississippi River Bridge in the background. 
Uh, it's one of the largest pump stations in the world. Uh, but the idea here is what's called the West Closure Complex. We can close here, and then we can try to pump water out. Um, the challenge with pumps is that you have to make sure they still work after a hurricane. Uh, the power might be out, uh, generators and other things. You have diesel powers and so forth, but um, um, those are challenges. But uh, $1 billion on this pump station, okay? This is basically like a giant power plant, okay? But to pump. So it's basically a huge consumption here. 19,000 CFS. Uh, 1,740 CFS for each one of these flower pot pumps. And this is the thing under construction here. Um, so it does get very expensive when you, uh, when you have to do this. Um, and this is a sort of an uh, illustrated cartoon drawing here. Um, but you're going to have something called a diesel engine up here, okay? And the reason there's this flower pot pump thing here is part of it once you flood you have to make sure that your diesel generators don't get uh, don't get flooded okay Fukushima as a reminder there for example okay so when you have your backup system you gotta make sure it doesn't flood uh, that's a challenge for pump station um, yeah so man-made coastal structures we can build levees and we can build bigger levees what's are there any alternatives uh, and um, and there are some, some, some questions there that have to be asked. So if you look at the Mississippi River, um, last 5,000 years, the delta has been going in different places, okay? Meandering 100 miles to the east, 100 miles to the west, and now we're stuck with number six, a bird foot delta, okay? The reason we're there, because we have levees, okay? Now if we do anything different, then the river would actually already go into Atchafalaya Basin down here towards Morgan City, uh, which basically will make Baton Rouge and New Orleans dry, okay, which would basically pull the rug of economic existence under these cities. Okay? So those are huge decisions that are very difficult to make. You just keep raising the levees, might go another 40 years, never to raise it again, Another 40 years, and we have to raise it again. How long are we playing this game, right? So that's one of these, uh, one of these fundamental questions that, of course, nobody wants to answer because relocation worldwide usually never works unless the people themselves decide they want to relocate, okay? That's the only time I've seen a successful relocation was in the Solomon Islands after a tsunami. The land had sunk after the earthquake by six feet, and the... And the tribal residents realized that, well, maybe we should abandon this place and go somewhere else. So I went there back there three years later and I converted their old town into a plantation and they have moved to a higher spot on the island. Um, but those are some fundamental questions that may have to be need to ask at some point. New Orleans got 300 years, but the next 300 years are going to have to see some questions answered probably at some point. But politicians don't stay in office long enough, so nobody's going to touch it. Okay, but. The, um, yeah, um, a couple of notes from an international perspective. So I've done work under UN contracts and so on around the world. Um, some places here. This one is a Myanmar here, or Burma. I, w I was there in 2008 uh, when the junta was still in charge, and uh, the junta was basically accused of not evacuating the delta because it was a minority and causing more than 100,000 people to die. Okay, um, and the I rotated the Mississippi here, okay? I done a little rotation by 90 degrees. It's just to compare a delta. This is the world's largest, one of the world's largest deltas here in the Irrawaddy uh, River, which has several fingers and mouths, but it's, a, it's an entire delta, okay? And this is what the Mississippi River Delta should look like, but instead we have this uh, weird structure, which is basically like a bird foot, uh, like a chicken leg. Um, yeah, in terms, of, in terms of mass casualties, um, we're doing pretty good in the United States, okay? Here we're concerned when we have, you know, 100, 200 fatalities. Um, that is, of course, 100, 200 too many, okay? Um, but uh, when it comes to mass casualties, uh, more than 10,000 deaths, uh, more than 100,000 deaths, then we're actually looking at the Bay of Bengal as kind of the epicenter of that, okay? There's the Indian Ocean tsunami down here in 2004. 
150,000 in Sumatra alone, uh, 250,000 altogether. But then we go to the top of the Bay of Bengal in, in, in Bangladesh. Then we have uh, um, the 1970 cyclone Bula, which uh, caused anywhere from 300 to 500,000 fatalities, which makes it the largest coastal disaster uh, in modern history, at least, or in history altogether. <coughs> Um, and Cyclone Nargis was this one right here in Myanmar, okay? Which was another one that nobody thought was going to happen because it's way further south than you would normally think it would gonna happen. A Category 4 striking at this latitude uh, is almost unprecedented in this area. They usually go north, they usually hit right there in Bangladesh, um, and Bangladesh has done a lot of enforcement. Bangladesh has built bunkers, they have uh, evacuation buildings uh, out of concrete, and there are fortresses where people basically can evacuate and have much better evacuation systems. So Bangladesh has no longer has uh, tens and hundred thousand fatalities during, during, during cyclones, but they're down to a, a couple of thousand in, in, in the worst case. So hopefully this is a, past, a, a symbol of the past. There's been a lot of progress on forecasting, on modeling, and so forth. So hopefully this is something, uh, something for the past that we're not going to see these kind of fatalities anymore. Uh, that's Cyclone Nargis here, uh, completely flooded. I had a chance to uh, spend a week on a boat um, surveying in the delta and getting some idea of how high the storm surge was. It was quite a bit less than during Hurricane Katrina actually, but just the people were so vulnerable. And when I was going out, I thought I was going to see these big mangroves and it was just going to be 100 miles of mangroves. But the reality was actually not quite that. There was actually quite a bit of erosion and there was quite a bit of mangroves that had been cut. Um, so there was a, a, a a stupa here, a golden temple that used to be on land that's now 500 feet out in the water. This is the one in Yangon, so that's not that size, okay, but uh, just for scale comparison. A drinking water well here uh, that's basically floating in the beach now. So that gives an idea of erosion. Uh, the same business here with mangroves. Um, some of the local uh, students helping here. This is tough business, a lot of uh, crocodiles and snakes in this area. Um, some of the human rebuilding, so people will always go back to where they left from. Uh, so here you're basically three feet, four feet, maybe five feet above the water. Okay, so extremely vulnerable, extremely vulnerable. Plays an important role in terms of whether you get a disaster or not. Then the other thing that was interesting here is that there were a lot of mangroves that were actually cut uh, for uh, charcoal, for cooking, uh, and so forth. Um, so instead of providing protection, that same village I showed you before is actually, is actually right here on the horizon. You can kind of recognize some blue-white blue tarp here. Uh, and those are actually mangrove fields that have been cut. So now these mangroves that could have provided some protection, um, in particular these large mangrove fields, um, at least from storm waves, um, didn't help anymore. This is a, a reforestation project here uh, that I visited in, in Thailand. This is after the Indian Ocean tsunami, it's a different location now. But uh, trying to reforest some of these mangroves in places, uh, in places where they have been, been cut uh, can be one potential mitigation strategy to at least get some reduction on waves and so forth. So when it gets storm surge reduction, you need miles and miles of mangroves. So it's going to get very complicated. Because with forests, the rule of thumb is, you know, it's about a foot per mile that you're bringing down, okay? So, so you need a lot of forest if you want to come down from 20 feet, okay? So, um, so um, it's not the solution to everything. And uh, just the one time I got to fly, actually, a Ukrainian uh, United Nations helicopter provided by the Ukrainian army at the time in, in Myanmar. So, um, so um, it was either flying that or spending another week on the boat getting back to Yango. So those were the options. And the last international example I want to briefly bring up is Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. Um, so this is a famous area, of course. If you have some Navy, Navy veterans here, OK. Uh, this is where uh, there's also a monument here for General MacArthur, uh, a statue where he comes ashore in World War II. OK, that's here. Um, we have Tacloban over here. This is where uh, General MacArthur walked ashore, the famous pictures you see from World War II. Okay? Um, so you have, you have Leyte and some other two islands. There's a little channel in between here. And that's where Tacloban sits, a large city. And this is how the ships looked uh, three months later. So these vessels were washed ashore, washed ashore by the, by, by, by the uh, typhoon Haiyan, or Yolanda as the locals call it, three, three months later. Okay? Their houses going up on the water side from these vessels. Okay? So, well, this is where just people died. 6,000 people were washed away. Okay, the house is gone. 
And the poorest of the poor are already putting shacks back up on the water side behind the stranded, behind the stranded vessels. Uh, so you know you're in a dangerous position. Uh, the other thing I want to show here is, uh, which, is, which is quite different to what we typically witness in the United States, is this was actually quite a big surprise for the international community here, um, that we can get a very fast storm surge. The reason this is happening is because um, of the way the storm came in into these islands. And now here it looks almost like a tsunami, how quick this comes in, and then basically uh, floods through here and, and uh, washes through this town here, uh, Hernani, and... Uh, in, um, in Leyte Island. There's a town called, the next town over is called uh, General MacArthur, okay? So um, just for, uh, for reference, this, and this is a, a time gap here, this is a little bit later, but this is what it looked like afterwards, okay? But to have a storm surge come in that fast, that was something that we actually were not used to seeing because we hadn't seen this in the Gulf of Mexico or in Florida or anywhere in the U.S. But um, this is what this town looked like. There was also a seawall here that had been damaged. Um, and you can see some of these houses, which are basically, oh, there's a Filipino student here, uh, almost all the way to the top, uh, washed out. Okay, uh, with that, I wanna, I wanna go towards conclusions here. And so the confusion with Camille 1969 being category five, surviving that with my house and not evacuating, um, caused fatalities during Hurricane Katrina, which happened to be a Category 3. But we have similar things with Hurricane Ian now. From some of the colleagues who have already gone down there, uh, there are people who, well, were debating about evacuating, in part because the evacuation orders in Lee County were given late. That's one. But the other was also that during Hurricane Irma in 2017, they fared quite well. And then there was also Hurricane Charlie um, a while back. that didn't cause that much problems there. Okay, so it can be dangerous when you witness previous storms and you make your call based on that. You should not rely on that. You should heed the warnings and evacuate, okay? So that is still the way to go. Now going forward, of course, is the big question as a civil engineer, can we continue evacuating the entire Florida Peninsula? Well, as population explodes, this might be difficult and we might have to start thinking about only have very targeted evacuations and we can't just evacuate huge swaths because too many people. So we're gonna have to have infrastructure it also allows, to, allows, also allows to ride out storms in place, okay? So shelter in place also has to be an option, at least for certain parts, um, that we can't just say, you know, the entire coast evacuate. If you do this in Georgia, it's quite easy. There's only, you know, there's only Savannah as a main population center uh, that would go up I-16, for example, uh, and there's Brunswick and so on, but, um, but it's pretty loosely populated, okay? But now as you have population growing fast in Florida, for example, uh, that might be difficult. Um, <clears throat> yeah, some of the other things um, in terms of forecasting that NOAA, of course, has been improving is to get forecasting uh, flood specific because the warning business, oh, it's a Cat 5, and now I have to go. Oh, it's a Cat 3, you don't have to go, but maybe Cat 2 can also kill you. Okay, so I think that's important. But we have to get forecasts to people, you know, in terms of having, being able to tell them, well, you're going to have 10 feet of water on Main Street in this town. So then it connects with the people. Oh, well, you know, 10 feet of water, I'm going to have a pretty impressive pickup truck, but this might not cut it, right? So, <laughs> so I think, I think that's, that's an important thing to do. Uh, some of the other things we've seen, of course, finding the last disaster is something that's always the case. Um, anywhere you go, um, uh, in Oman after cyclone, Sultanate of Oman and the Arabian Sea after cyclone Gonu, uh, rebuilding and uh, building a new port uh, um, um, on the coastline. One of the first questions they ask you when you sit down is, is, is cyclone Gonu in this study? You know, did you make sure that's covered? So, the, um, so that's the same thing here in the U.S. So Hurricane Katrina for New Orleans is kind of the, the go-to case and Hurricane Ian will be for Fort Myers in the re reconstruction. Uh, but we do have to think a little bit about the future, you know, in terms of uh, how we manage wetlands, how we manage mangroves, um, how we manage rivers. Uh, is this Mississippi River situation sustainable in the long run? Okay, there are going to be serious questions to ask there uh, going forward. Um, and of course, it's the multi-hazard with uh, rare events like tsunamis and then sea level rise, which is the big unknown in the room. Okay, so there is some sea level rise, obviously measurable, but um, it's not going to be uniform. There might be some breaking points. Things might go faster at some point and so forth. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of unknowns there. And with that, um, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Thank you, everybody.
Would these pictures be available anywhere great, great. online? Yeah, so so the so the pictures, um, are most of my most of them are my survey pictures. So pictures that I took when I was surveying out there, and I complemented that with one or the other to, for uh, for explanation. But most of them are actually my pictures. Yeah. So not available. Yeah, but I can I can uh, I can supply I can supply you photos if you need them. Uh, for Hurricane Katrina, I, I uploaded all my all my. Uh, all my survey photos on a web page at Georgia Tech that's semi-functional still, but it's been a while, but, um, um, but yeah, so it's, it's part of it's available, yeah, yeah. And if you have any particular photos you're interested in, I will always, can always get those to you, yeah. How many here have a LinkedIn profile? LinkedIn. What would you say about tonight's on the LinkedIn tomorrow? <laughs> I, I challenge you to go ahead and post something. Yeah, more than three words, please. <laughs> Certainly like it. If you, if you saw a little tidbit here that you like in particular, I'll mention it. You're not talking about the presentation, so. But tonight's presentation, so this doesn't need to be on the recording. Yeah, he can edit all that afterwards if he wants to. Are there any other questions? You guys have any other questions? <laughs> Yes, yes. Given that people are just going to want to move to those areas, and the population keeps growing, and like you said, trying to build these levees and these things to, to shield you from them, uh, can, can we get, get you so far? far? Should the focus be on? on how to quickly get people out of that situation uh, rather than, than who, who knows, knows where the, what, what the weather will be. Where we we can't, can't forecast, but 36, 36 sometimes 24 hours, hours ahead of time. So, so it should, should focus on how to get people quickly evacuated. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent point. So generally speaking, evacuation is always a good idea. Okay, being able to get people out of harm's way, that should always be the goal. Uh, so if you know if we can if we can do that, um, and if we have the infrastructure to sustain getting all these people out without having one huge bottleneck and then everybody getting slammed while they're in their cars on I four trying to uh, trying to get out, uh, so 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 that is then the challenge, right? So then you're in a worse situation perhaps than when you were trying to trying to. Um, shelter in a house in Orlando, for example, right? Now for those beachfront communities like Fort Myers and so forth, evacuation is the only strategy. Because once you, once you flood, you know, once you have 20 feet of water or 15 feet of water, you know, on the beach and then 10 feet in your road, uh, your chance of dying is pretty high, you know, compared to from wind speed. Uh, your chance of dying in the water is probably 50 times higher at that point uh, compared to being hit by some debris. So, um, so yeah, trying to get people out is very critical. So there are, there are efforts in Japan, for example, for tsunami-related uh, situations, uh, you know, to realize where they realize that at some point you cannot build, you know, a 100-foot wall to protect. Because no, a, nobody wants to, in Japan, they have these things. Okay, they have 30-foot concrete walls. When you drive into the beach, you can't see the beach. Now I'm driving down, I'm looking at this concrete monstrosity, I have to go behind it to actually get to the water. Um, which is also a horrible situation, will never be accepted in the United States. You know, everybody wants to see waterfront, beach, uh, even if there's dunes there that might protect you, we would actually bulldoze those dunes so that we can look out, right? So the, um, um, but in Japan they're trying to integrate, uh, you know, some of those coastal defenses into the transportation infrastructure so that then these, uh, these corridors for highways and for uh, high-speed rail and so forth also serve as embankments uh, for flood protection, for example, uh, for events. But it can be ways to try to combine things and, and make it more, uh, uh, more resilient as a, as a society. But definitely, if you can get people out, by all means, evacuation is always the best way to save your life. Uh,
facility, specifically a nuclear power, and, and uh, <coughs> is there, is there a, a, a wall built uh, around? Yes. Yeah, so, so in the United States, fortunately, we haven't had any major nuclear mishaps in Three Mile Island. Um, but there are, there are uh, nuclear reactors on the coast in the United States. Uh, so, for example, in Florida and Miami, you have Turkey Point, okay, which, uh, which sits right down there uh, by Bay Key Biscayne, which fortunately is, you know, far enough to the east that it was sort of a non-event for, 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 for that power plant. Um, there have, however, been events uh, where, where nuclear power plants have been channels, challenged, and uh, I've worked on Fukushima, so I've, I've been to Fukushima in Japan, um, and um, and then that caused, uh, you know, it was it was a fundamental design flaw there, uh, in the sense that um, there were other nuclear reactors that were built, for example, to 50 feet elevation, and at Fukushima there was only a 20 foot wall. Um, and there would actually historically been a bluff there, so, so to, uh, to make operation cheaper that was actually excavated and the power plant was built lower uh, so that you, it's cheaper to pump afterwards when you're cooling, right? Um, but but uh, it, was, it was a huge blunder there and it's probably an inside job in the sense that the, the, the engineering was done in-house by, by Tokyo Power Company, but there were other power companies 100 miles north uh, who built their nuclear reactors at 50 feet elevation. So even just by looking at it, there should have been some warning signs. Well, why are these guys, you know, 50 feet above sea level and you go down here have a 20 foot sea wall, right? And you're only 100, 100 miles apart. So something cannot add up, right? So there should have been warning signs. And also the design tsunami that they took in Japan for Fukushima was a 1960 Chile tsunami, which happens to be the largest earthquake ever recorded with modern instruments in World War II, since we have modern instruments. Um, but it's also 17,000 kilometers, more than 10,000 miles away from Fukushima. So they completely underdesigned because they had the Japan Trench right in front of their nose, right? But they didn't take that as a worst case scenario. And for nuclear reactors, you have to design for 10,000 year hazards, okay? Which usually then ends up being some kind of a tsunami, okay? Even on the United States East Coast, it usually ends up being, for a 10,000 year hazard, it usually ends up being some submarine slide off the, off the continental shelf. And how that gets implemented is then usually like something like a maximum probable uh, landslide generated tsunami could be your worst case scenario, but there's usually no probability down here. There's usually, because what is a 10,000 year hazard, nobody actually knows, but, um, but what's usually done there is some assumption of what could potentially fail on the seafloor to come up with the worst case scenario. Um, but in the United States, all the nuclear reactors had to be recertified and, and the design criteria had to be reanalyzed after Fukushima. So that also shows that at one event, like a Fukushima natural disaster, can change the design criteria for everybody. And there are places like, you know, there are places like Diablo Canyon in California, right? That uh, not too long ago, they were thinking about taking offline and now being pressed for power, you know, uh, we're keeping it running, right? So, so that's called politics, but um, uh, yeah. So the so chances are, of course, you know, with, with the tsunamis, they're very infrequent events. So chances are that, you know, that um, these 10,000-year uh, events or these even 500-year events, you know, there's, there are big gaps in between, right? So uh, for a beach house, probably you can, you can still rebuild and be okay because if a beach house gets washed away, you know, every 50 years or every 500 years, it's probably okay. But if it's a nuclear reactor, it might not be. So that's the, uh, that's the challenge, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, wow. Thank you very much for taking the time to come here. And I'd uh, like you to, this is all, let me take it out of the bag. Uh, super. Excellent. I'm, 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 I drink a lot of coffee, so this comes in very handy. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
pictures, I was most interested in was Hurricane Ian. I liked your before and after pictures. Oh, okay, no, so those things that I got from the internet. Yeah, those things I got from the internet. I have not been to Fort Myers after Hurricane Ian, so I have not been down there yet. A lot of us aren't going soon. Yeah, yeah, so the, so the real, the real be work to do down there. Um, survey work and so forth, but, uh, but you don't want to be too early. You don't want to be in the way of... Uh, uh, Please remember the secretary. We hope you enjoyed this presentation given at one of the Atlanta Metro Chapter meetings of the Georgia Society of Professional Engineers, an affiliate of the National Society of Professional Engineers. To find out more about us or to join us, check us out at gspe.org.